thank you for joining us again. You are my go-to girl when it comes to understanding the LSAT. And I just got back from a couple law school admission forums. And it's always a pleasure for me to be able to refer you because that's how much I believe in you, even though I have no interest or financial gain in what you're doing, but you always impress me. So when I heard that the LSAC was going to change the way they test and um, also you know, hearing, you know, from being in the law school community and the admissions community, things about rumblings about the ABA requirements for admission, I knew who to come to. So thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me on, Leslie. Always a pleasure to speak with you. And I always appreciate the kind words. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we, uh, there's two things I want to talk about. And the first is um, L LSAC, which is the law school admissions um, committee, conference? Council. 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 It could, be, it could have been right. any of those, though. Was, <laughs> third time's the charm, uh, which we affectionately call LSAC. Um, and I heard there, or you told me, I shouldn't even say I heard, you informed me that they're changing the um, test, the LSAT, with regard to logic games. And I think what piqued my interest most is that it stems from a lawsuit. Can you talk a little bit about the origins of the need for the change, and then we can talk about what the change is? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So this was quite a few years back. Of course, lawsuits take time to unfold. The consequences take time as well. Back in the fall of 2019, LSAC settled a lawsuit with a blind test taker, Angelo Bino. Angelo Bino was a pre-law student looking to take the LSAT, apply to law school. The thing was that he was he's blind. And so as a result of being blind, he couldn't really benefit from diagramming logic games the way that most test takers can. And so he felt that he was at an unfair disadvantage relative to others. And so he sued, contending that he was at he, uh, under the Americans with Disabilities Act. He wanted uh, fair compensation in some way to mm -hmm. account for this. So, all right, so fair compensation. So the question is, Logic games, I mean, they've been a part of the LSAT since I took the LSAT a long time ago. But how do you compensate someone for not being able to participate in what's probably roughly one third? Is that about fair to say? What percentage of the LSAT are logic so, so, so currently it's about one third. Back when he was suing them, it was about one fourth. But either way, I mean, given the difference of just a few points, that, right. that makes a significant impact on your chances, right? Yeah. Um, so my first question is, how do you compensate someone for that? That's a great question. There's not really an easy answer to that one. And LSAC is very big on statistics and properly calibrating everything. So if you just, I could imagine one possible solution would be at the time, since it was one quarter of the exam, you just remove that section for him, let him take the other three sections, and then effectively uh, imagine some sort of prorated version of the exam, what would be his ultimate score if it only had 75 questions or so rather than 100. Right. Um, and he was not satisfied with that or... or um... I, don't think, I don't think they offered him that solution. That might have been my solution for, mm -hmm. for him at the time if I were LSAC. They basically said, tough luck, essentially. And they say, we give you all sorts of other accommodations. There's someone who will read the exam questions to you. There's, mm -hmm. you can get, maybe get extra time, but he said, you know, ultimately to do equally well as other test takers on logic games, I would need to be able to diagram. I can't do that. I can't juggle all this stuff in my head, which I think is pretty reasonable. I mean, right. I don't well, think I could do as well on logic games doing it all in my head. Right. So right. I, I think he had a point there. So he sues, where do he sue? Do you know which, uh, where I'm assuming it was federal court. You don't know where, do you? I don't know where I do. I do believe it was federal since he was under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And okay. so ultimately they, they settled the lawsuit in fall of 2019. And what was the result? So the result was that LSAC agreed to complete research and development into a new version of the exam without the, that would allow test takers to take a version of the exam without the logic game section. They would complete that research and development within the next four years. Right. All right. So that's now. That's only that's a, that's a, about a year away. We're almost there. So they have actually started that research and development process. Mm -hmm. And you, but you don't know how it's going to come out, do you? I have guesses. I mean, no one knows for certain. LSAC has not formally announced everything. I mean, of course, completing research and development is a little bit different from saying we will definitely remove the game section altogether. And right. so some of the headlines you see around this are a little bit hy hyperbolic, I guess. But it does seem that they're making big steps, which suggests that they will probably change the exam for everyone. Yeah, well, all right, so a few things. One is, that's it's unfortunate that they, they I, I would, let me, how do I say this? I hope that they come up with a fair test for everyone that does kind of 
um, lock into the logic and analysis because one of the things I like to tell my students is that the keys to success in law school is to get out of your undergrad head. That law school is about analysis, right? And it's about logic and thinking. And I always find it so ironic because the skill set that gets you the grades to get into law school, memorizing during lectures, right? is not the skill set that gets you good grades in law school. You have to completely do a 180. So that was why I liked um, the LSAC. I have one other question on this. You may or may not know the answer, but I know when we talk about the affirmative action cases that a lot of these cases are brought by plaintiffs who are found by a public interest group that's interested in bringing down affirmative action. So they basically go out, find a plaintiff, say to the plaintiff, we see that you've been injured. And, you know, injured meaning, you know, haven't gotten into their school, not physically injured. And we're going to support your law, your your challenge. Do you think that happened to you? Or do you think this was, I mean, this was just someone who rightfully so felt he was being unfairly um, hindered? That is a great question. So you're suggesting that in some cases there's more of like an activist attorney who goes yes. around looking yeah. for, for yeah. plaintiffs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, in, in this case, I'm not so sure about that. I mean, it's interesting because actually... Angelo Bino, who is the, the 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 lead plaintiff on this, he he's blind. The attorney who represented him is also blind. Oh, so I'm not sure who who um, started things off, but I do know that also. I'm pretty sure there have been other lawsuits on the part of blind test takers. There, I think there was one on the, from the National Federation of the Blind. That was a separate lawsuit. Right. I'm fuzzy on the details of that one, but. I, I would imagine that case, of course, there was an organization, a nonprofit, starting mm -hmm. kind of spurring on that one. But this one, I'm not really sure, to be honest. I, I, yeah, I'm sorry. What I was just going to say that in this case, I mean, given that these are pre-law students specifically who were already somewhat legally minded, right. I wouldn't be surprised if it was the pre-laws themselves who were spurring this one. Right, right. And we don't know what score he got, do we? I don't think we know. I, 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 I actually, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know off the top of my head, but. I, I it's I would guess it's probably publicly available with a little bit of digging. And here's the thing with LSAC. I mean, in the case of accommodations, they look at someone who got, a, let's say hypothetically, a 155. And they say, a 155 is above the median, which is a 151. Therefore, you weren't at an unfair disadvantage. And you could say, well, I got a 155 under these less than ideal conditions. Just right. imagine how much better I could have done had right. I gotten proper accommodations and gotten a 165 or a 175, how would that change things for me? Right. So I don't know what his score was. I, I think it was above the median, which might have been why they weren't doing as much as they could have. All right. So that's really interesting. And I find it triply interesting that they're talking about changing the logic games at a time when there's a potential for the LSAT to become obsolete. I know that's a grand idea. But I do also know um, that the ABA has been thinking about it. That some, first of all, some schools will take the GRE in lieu of the LSAT, um, and the ABA is now thinking of eroding that even further and saying we don't need you to take an LSAT. And as someone who's been on the admissions committee a lot of times, that's a little problematic because one of the things that the LSAT does do, barring the discussion we just had about inequity based on ability is that it gives us kind of an easy way to say, okay, we're cutting the line here, above the line you're in, and we don't need to go through thousands and thousands of applications. And also it's fair. So I, you know, so I, I, it's interesting to me. So tell me a little bit about the ABA and their plans. Yeah, sure. And I think it's a, it's a great point you made that, I mean, the LSAT is kind of an, an equalizer in terms of it allows admissions committees to compare applicants from different backgrounds, regardless of different majors and such. So I get what you're saying there. And I, I agree with you, actually, in terms of its usefulness. The uh, you know, There's a big test optional movement in higher education overall, of course, and legal field is a bit slower than others to adapt to changes, but it's finally reached the LSAT and the American Bar Association. It's um, and this, it's been up for a vote a few times. This time, it looks like it's finally going to go through. Uh, last month in November, the ABA Legal Education Committee approved the proposed revisions to Standard 503, which requires currently that law schools use a valid and reliable admission test. Used to be just the LSAT. They since added in the GRE, as you, as you mentioned. So valid and reliable admission test is quite open-ended. They want to remove that language and say, you can consider it, but you're not required to use it. So law schools may be free to continue using in the LSAT or others exam as a requirement, but they will no longer be obligated to do so. If this change goes through in February, which is the final step, which it almost certainly will, then that change affects law school admissions starting fall 2025. You know, and I wonder if schools will continue 
to use the LSAT. And I also wonder if it'll serve as a hindrance to, to, to applicants. Like, why would I go to a school that asked for an LSAT if I don't like my LSAT? which kind of ties into this whole US News and World Report issue, right? Because if you, you know, one of the reasons applicants pick schools is based on the rankings, which we can have another discussion on rankings. I am not a fan of the rankings, but that aside, I'm thinking to myself, let's say two schools are equally ranked. One school takes the LSAT, one doesn't. I'm applying to the school that doesn't take the LSAT, unless the LSAT will get me money, I guess. Well, that's a, that's a great point actually, is that your LSAT score, has a big impact on your ability to get merit scholarships. And so, and it gives you merit scholarships because law schools that, you know, law schools want to raise their status in the rankings. So it does tie in very clearly and very closely with the rankings. So that's a great point. There are concerns, let's say schools that don't require the rankings, don't require the LSAT, will they get a flood of applications from applicants who maybe are not as strong candidates or maybe those who are not considering law school as seriously? That's an open question. So we'll kind of see which law schools do remove that requirement. Oh, you know, I didn't think about that. Like, no pun intended, but the LSAT is a bar to entry. <laughs> <laughs> and so you're right. It, 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 it behooves the schools to take them for that reason. The other thing is the reason, as I understand it, that the LSAT gets you money for a merit scholarship is because a higher LSAT is of value to a school because of the U.S. News and World Report. So if the U.S. News and World isn't relevant anymore, then the higher LSAT may not be relevant anymore. That is true. And then one consequence of that might be that given that LSAT scores are the strongest single predictor of first-year law school grades, which then ties into bar passage rates, would schools that accept applicants without an LSAT score who might have done worse on the LSAT, might those schools see a drop in their bar passage rates, which then could potentially jeopardize their ABA accreditation. This is, of course, a lot of ifs and maybes, no, but no, I'm yeah. just following the chain all the way to the end. That That's a really good point, too. So there's two reasons for a school to accept the LSAT. One is to um, make it, you know, as we said, kind of like that means you really want to um, be admitted to law school. You know, you, you've taken that extra step. You've studied that more. And it also does tie to bar passage rate. And bar passage rate is always going to be a predictor. I don't see them getting rid of the bar in any anytime soon. And the reason the bar is called the bar is because it's a bar to get, it's not because you drink, it's a bar to getting into law school. So, um, and, yeah. And here's, and here's one other reason that schools might want to use the LSAT. I mean, they're currently, they have been required to use some valid and reliable admission test. That has typically been the LSAT. LSAT is still is the biggest player in town, but law schools aren't required to weigh it as heavily as they do. I mean, they could say we're going to consider it 1% out right. of 100, but right. they. I mean, my understanding is based on the, the published admissions indices on LSAT's website that most schools weigh the LSAT more heavily than GPA and typically something like three to five times as highly, higher higher than GPA maybe perhaps in part due to things like grade inflation or different variation in difficulty of different majors. Wow. So, all right. So I'm a law student. I'm a, I'm a high uh, college student thinking about applying to law school. What do I do? Act as if nothing's changed. I mean, the things that we're talking about are all very interesting and the, they could affect things down the line. But if you're listening to this now and you're not yet in law school, you probably will be in the next couple of years, which means that this is all very interesting. So everything is changing, but also at the same time, nothing is changing. Logic games will not be changed on the LSAT until at the earliest, I would guess, June 2024. We're speaking now very end of 2022. And then the ABA removing the requirement that law schools use the LSAT, that change will not go into effect until fall 2025 assuming it does go through. And even when it does go through starting fall 2025, law schools will probably, for the most part, still require the LSAT, even if they are not required to require the LSAT. So that's a bit of legal mumbo jumbo for you there, <laughs> but that, that is the consequence. So I would act as if nothing has changed. All right. So you want to keep studying for the LSAT. And if you need to study for the LSAT, um, Steve, tell us about your podcast, your website, and, and all of the free goodies that you supply to students who are interested in taking the um, LSAT and doing well in it. Of course, of course, Leslie, I'm glad to help. So again, my name is Steve Schwartz. I'm the founder and CEO of LSAT Unplugged. I've got tons of free resources, including, uh, including the LSAT Unplugged YouTube channel, the LSAT Unplugged podcast. I also have 
live online classes via Zoom several nights a week, along with study groups and on-demand videos covering the basics. So if you're just getting started, you can dive in with my resources. And of course, you can always reach out to me for more help. You can email me, help at lsatunplugged.com. And I will tell you, as a law professor of more years than I'm willing to admit, there's no one better in the business. Thanks so much for taking the time to speak with me, Steve. Thanks so much for having me, Leslie. Appreciate it. Steve, thank you so much for joining me again. Um, you are, as I tell everyone, the go-to when it talks about studying for the LSAT. And one of the key reasons you study for the LSAT is to get into law school. And once you do well on the LSAT, you have to decide what law school to go to. And this is a long way of saying that students look at U.S. News and World Report, which I will just say in my mind, and I've written an article called Ratings, Ratings Fetishism, because this is how much I don't like the U.S. News and World Report, that Stop. I got to read. I got to redo this. Right. I got to do an intro. I'll do the intro after. OK, let me let me start again. Um, Welcome, because it's a new podcast. I'm so happy to have you. Um, you are my go to when it comes to the LSAT and studying for the LSAT. And so I thought you'd be a wonderful guest to join me today to talk about U.S. news and whether US news is gonna become obsolete now that a few schools have stated that they're getting rid of it. And the reason why I think it's important to think about is that students take the LSAT so that they can get a good score to get into a good school and they define a school, many students, by ranking. Personally, I don't, I don't approve of that. I think some schools are much better than their rankings and others are not. But I'd like to chat with you a little bit about this idea of how schools are thinking when it comes to abolishing U.S. news, what do you, what are your thoughts? Yeah, sure, Leslie, and, <laughs> and thank you, <laughs> of course, and thank you so much for having me on again. I appreciate I always appreciate the chance to talk through these these big news items with you. So, the, the Yale and Harvard start kind of kicked off the the um, exodus from the U.S. news rankings. On the one hand, I'm glad to see this that so many schools are dropping out of the rankings because I think the rankings do get too much weight, especially from applicants, and it also has some un, uh, undesirable consequences in terms of how it incentivizes schools to admit or deny applicants. So I'm glad to see the criticism. I'm glad to see schools saying we don't value the we don't value things the way U.S. News does. And so I'm glad to see that. On the other hand, I do have some questions about how this might affect schools granting or not granting scholarships, especially merit aid. Well, you know, and, and the reason that's important is because merit aid is based quite often on your LSAT or your GPA, and that U.S. News weighs heavily the LSAT score. So if there's no U.S. News, there's no reason to value the LSAT for purposes of improving a school's ranking. There is reason to value the LSAT for purposes of deciding whether a student is um, has has the analytical ability to the extent that the LSAT measures it for their classroom, but it does kind of place a little less emphasis on the importance of the LSAT in terms of ranking. Exactly. And that's actually a comment that a lot of the admission, the, the deans made when they were making their announcements that they were going to stop submitting data to U.S. News. However, the schools are saying, we think that the, the U.S. News rankings incentivize schools to give out lots of merit aid when that money could have gone to need-based financial aid instead, which um, I, I think is a fair point. However, I'm not for I'm not so sure that schools will take that money that was going to merit aid and instead devote it to need-based aid. Schools that have enormous endowments, like Yale and Harvard, may be able to do that. But for some lower-ranked schools with less you know less money available, they might not make that choice. I think U.S. News actually gives schools reason to give out more merit aid more than they might have otherwise, which is to the benefit of applicants, which is the perspective that I'm looking at here. That's really interesting because truthfully, and I think I, I, I may have mentioned this, I wrote an article called Ratings Fetishism, and it's all about how schools have changed their academic rigor or academic, uh, just parts of their ac academic program to kind of pander to U.S. news. Um, but you are pointing out to me something positive about U.S. news, which is that it does give merit scholarships to students um, who deserve them. And that I see what you're saying. So let's say a school is completely tuition based and they don't have a big endowment and they have $100,000 for argument's sake to give to students. What you're saying is that they're not gonna give it at all um, because now they don't have to give it to buy students, so to speak. 
that's a bummer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, it's kind of interesting how, you know, we all hate the rankings for good reason, but they do serve some sort of useful purpose in this particular way for applicants and for applicants who don't have tons of money, but might not meet the criteria for need-based aid, or especially if there's a limited number of slots for need-based aid, then the LSAT, improving their LSAT score is the biggest way they can get scholarship money to potentially even get a full ride to go to mm -hmm. law school. So that could make the difference for them. Wow. Do you know if um, US News ranks the GRE? Because I know some schools have the option of applying with a GRE versus a um, LSAT. That's a great question. I'm not entirely sure how they factored the GRE into the rankings. That's not an either. interesting question. But however, I do know that if you have an LSAT score on record, even if you then take the GRE later, your LSAT score is what will be submitted to US News as a metric oh, really? student. Yeah. And so what, let's say a student hypothetically does better. I don't know, you know, it's apples and oranges a little bit, but let's say they do better on the LSA, on the GRE than the LSAT. They'll still submit the LSAT. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. But they only, it used to be they averaged the LSAT. Now they only submit the highest LSAT, right? That's right. Yeah. So that's a change going back to 2006. The American Bar Association changed the requirements in terms of what schools have to submit to them from being the average of scores to the highest of these scores, which had a big impact on students' behavior because now there's reason to retake. Before you might have been concerned about it, now there's really no downside. And why do you think the LSAT is so important to a school in terms of understanding who their student body will be? Well, a big thing is grade inflation. I mean, a lot of majors in college have grade inflation, and it varies between majors and between institutions. And so you know, uh, let's say a B in engineering might indicate a stronger application than someone who has an, who has an A in English. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking strictly at GPAs, you're going to choose the person with an A in English, even though the B in engineering was actually represents uh, more rigor and uh, an applicant who has more aptitude. So for that reason, actually, um, Kelly Testy, the dean of the the uh, the I'm not sure what she was, the CEO of LSAC, I forget the exact title. She uh -huh. was saying on, on a webinar that GPAs are so inflated as to be essentially meaningless, wow. which might have been strong language, but I, I think she has a point there. And yeah. so, and she's also a little bit biased, of course, but I think, again, she still has a point there that the LSAT is an equalizer in a sense, because no matter what your major, no matter what your background, you're taking the LSAT. I do believe it's a fair exam. It's not perfect, but I think it's the best we've got. And it's mm -hmm. the best the best indicator of how an applicant is likely to do in law school. Right. That is true. It is the great equalizer in that respect, arguably, you know, I mean, people of course can take it away. Um, so, so you pointed out and, and I know too, that some of the, you know, we have the T14, right. The top 14 schools and, you know, I don't know, there's this arbitrary line about the T14, but some of those schools, Harvard and Yale have opted out of participating in U S news. They can actually, they can, right. What do you mean about the other schools? Yeah, sure. So at this point, it's well over a dozen schools have withdrawn from the U.S. News rankings. Are they all top-ranked schools? Are they on the top tier? Most of them are in the top 14 or a good number A good number of the T14 have withdrawn. There are some schools outside the T14 that have withdrawn as well. To be honest, I've stopped, I've stopped tracking just because there's so many and they're so varied. Uh -huh. But I should mention here, it's important that even if a school chooses not to submit data to U.S. News, of course, schools are free to submit data or not to submit data. U.S. News can still rank them either way, and U.S. News will still rank them either oh, way. That's a really good point. Here I thought we were going to automatically go up all these points because <laughs> there, <was> less, <laughs> there are fewer people in the ranking. That's too bad. Actually, do you know that um, three USC students, University of Southern California students, just filed a lawsuit against the um, law school because the law school arguably t tampered with their own um, submission to uh, U.S. News. And as a consequence, the law, these law students are arguing that U.S. News ranked them higher than they really should have been based on the data. And so they're saying that there was fraud in the inducement of accepting their admission to USC. Well, that's really something. That's really something. I mean, USC wouldn't be the first school that has tampered with its data. I know that Columbia University, the undergrad institution at Columbia, faced a lot of pressure and kind of a lot of criticism because they misreported data as well, and their rankings dropped significantly. I think there might have even been a similar lawsuit going on there at Columbia. But yes, I mean, of course, I mean, it's, um, it's problematic that U.S. News relies on self-reported data at all when schools have such great incentive to misreport or play games with the numbers.
But if they don't rely on self-reported data, where are they going to get the data from? Well, for law school, they could get it from the ABA. Oh, right. Because you have to report to the ABA. Why don't they do that? That's a great question. And I think <laughs> I, I'm not totally sure why, but yes, I mean, if they were relied solely upon publicly available data, right. then they schools wouldn't have the same ability to necessarily game things. I mean, it might be a bigger problem for a school to misreport to the ABA than to report to U.S. News because U.S. News has no authority over the schools. The right. ABA can shut them down if malfeasance is found. Right. So that's interesting. Well, you know, there are other, you know, factors that, you know, like faculty reputation and, and um, diversity issues. So there are other criteria on which U.S. News relies, but it seems to me I, I've never reported. I, I voted. Um, but I've never reported. You know, they do ask us to vote in the U.S. News on faculty reputation and um, also like rank particular programs like criminal law program. I actually, my law school, what's interesting. So my law school, I teach at Pace, has the number one environmental law program in the country, but is ranked in the third tier. So it's a blessing and a curse, right? Um, so we want them not way I'll say just for myself, I won't speak for my school, but I, I enjoy being first in the country and a lot of students come to pace for that. But then I don't think that we deserve a third tier ranking because I know that the quality of our teaching is very, very strong. So it's a blessing and a curse. What do you think that this will get momentum? Um, schools dropping out of US News? I do think it will. I do think more schools will drop out and probably more schools will vocally withdraw than vocally stay in necessarily to make in terms of making big public statements about it i think ultimately us news will have to have to go back to have to change its rankings to rely solely upon data publicly available data because they can't if they can't really properly rank so many schools based on the the non public data it right. kind of becomes problematic for the rankings and of course you can't just stop ranking the schools that withdrew i mean uh, a ranking system that removed Yale and Harvard and a lot of the other T14 schools would not be that useful for applicants and would, you couldn't really view it that seriously to leave out such prestigious schools. Yeah. I do have I do have a question for you though about um you mentioned reputation. Right. I mean, I know the reputation score is I think it's the biggest single factor in the rankings. Does it not become kind of circular in a way given that the rankings kind of create public perceptions about the schools? Yeah, um yes, it does, but you know, I think the answer is yes. But I think that one of the things a school can do and does do is they can improve their reputation, but the reputation is on scholarly production more than teaching. So for instance, what happens as all these law schools get, I mean, it used to be complete hard copies. Now we get some in the emails, but all law schools send out to other law schools, you know, meet our new faculty, see their new scholarship, see everyone's scholarship. And so that's, so the thing is, you know, I know that there's some really interesting scholarship going on at this school. I'm going to favor that school. Now, not all faculty vote for U.S. News. I think it's it's the deans, it's the head of the admissions committee, uh, or the appointments committee, I'm sorry, the you know hiring committee, um, and maybe the head of the admissions committee. So there's just select people who get to vote for U.S. News. But the reputation, you're right. I mean, how, we don't rank the school. We rank every school from like one to 10 or something like that. I, I It's been a while since I've been um, chosen to vote. But so it's not like I say, okay, I think Yale's first, Harvard's second. What happens is I say, you know, what kind of scholarly production is Yale putting out on a scale of one to 10? What kind of scholarly production is Harvard putting out on a scale of one to 10? So you do that across the board. Right. But, right. you know, when, you, you, when you're when you a school in the Northeast and not well known across the country, you know, it's hard to build your reputation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's a problem. But but I think you're right that there are some there's some value to the students aside from choosing a law school from U.S. News. So I'll agree with that. I will say this, too. Um, do you you know, and you probably counsel students, too. I think when picking a law school, I tend to say um, if you can get into a T14, great. And other than that way how much money you're getting from the school because you do get as good an education at most of these schools. And also the other thing I say to students is um, figure out where you wanna practice and whether career services kind of feeds into that area. Um, 
So yeah, so I think that those are other things to look at besides. Oh, the- certainly, certainly. No, I think I think uh, avoidance of debt is a huge one, and yeah. that's that ties into the discussion about merit aid earlier. And then second, secondly, I think also where you want to practice, and especially regional, right? I mean, to go to to choose a number seventeen over a number twenty eight, even mm-hmm. though number twenty eight is in your region, number right. seventeen may not be as well known in your region. So to to make decisions purely on the basis of of relatively small numerical differences, I think is problematic. Yeah. You know, what's interesting. So when I went to law school, they didn't rank schools. I went to University of Florida. Now, University of Florida is one of the top schools in the country, right? So all of a sudden, I graduated from a school that's now, you know, so now my reputation, <laughs> you know, I can, I'm proud to say, you know, I went to University of Florida. So I guess I'm wondering too, you know, from a from a practice perspective, if U.S. news goes away, is that going to change the prestige of people as they apply for jobs or as they go to different, you know, as they apply to schools, as they do lateral moves or something like that? Um, I, I, I'm hesitant to say that I think U.S. news is going to go away, though, because as we said, you know, law schools can, U.S. news will still rank law schools and they will probably just change their criteria to rely solely on publicly available data. So I'm not sure this is actually going to have a, a huge impact. I think this might be another one of those things where everything's changing, but nothing's changing, where like U.S. news will still have an impact in the public perception. And the, the T14 in particular are relatively fixed. I don't think that you know, they, they've right. changed so little since the, the beginning of the rankings anyway that mm-hmm. I think it's the rankings play a role. But I, th- I think they're, while some schools change, a lot of schools don't change that much. And right. University of Florida has probably always had a good reputation in in Florida in general. Right. Yeah, in Florida always. Um, nationally, I'm more now than it did when I graduated. But anyway, but it was still- Well, nice for you. <laughs> <laughs> Win-win. Um, so yeah, so that's really interesting. So the moral of the story, according to you, and I'm going to agree with it, is that people are going, yeah, schools are going to walk away from US News, but US News is not going to walk away from the schools. So it's kind of here to stay. And- um, We'll see how it plays out with schools. I, I will say this again: all the schools who have left can afford to leave. I think yeah. that's the case. So, but you're right, you know. And I hadn't thought about this. Like, just because they're not part of, they're not participating, doesn't mean that that U.S. News can't rank them. So, um, bummer for all the schools who are left. I really did think we were going <laughs> to go up. Anyway, um, thank you so much for talking to me about this. So interesting. You really. Um, you really know that. Now, I know that most of my listeners are law school um, students, and they're actually studying for law school exams, not the LSAT, but to the extent that they have significant others or siblings, tell us how they can recommend you or find you um, to teach people how to do well in the LSAT. Of course. Thanks, Leslie. So again, my name is Steve Schwartz, founder and CEO of LSAT Unplugged. I run live online prep classes, and I also offer on-demand video lessons. The live classes are via Zoom almost every night. I've got free resources as well, including the LSAT Unplugged YouTube channel, the LSAT Unplugged podcast. I'm also on Instagram, Twitter, even TikTok. And folks can always email me at help at LSATunplugged.com. Great. And I encourage you to tell your friends, if they are taking the LSAT, to check out Steve Schwartz's material. It is spectacular. Thank you for taking the time to speak with me. Thank you, Leslie. Appreciate it. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.